Hello everyone and welcome back to Electronics Prepper, the channel where we try to learn as much as possible about electronics to become more self-reliant with technology and prepare for the future. So a while ago one of uh, the viewers of this channel suggested that I would um, delve into the topics of LDO, low dropout um, linear <coughs> voltage uh, regulators. I already had the idea of studying uh, such things at some point in time. I wasn't going to do anything on this topic very soon. However, recently I uh, I um, had I started to have this need of uh, having a simple but good enough LDO for my own purposes, for my own projects and well, that kind of forced me into, you know, doing a little bit of research and um, a little bit of uh, what you might call tinkering, um, doing a little bit of experiments to see what could work and how could we build a simple but still good enough um, low dropout uh, voltage uh, regulator. I am far from truly understanding all the complexities of such circuits, um, so I cannot um, help you in this regard from top to bottom yet. Um, but what I can is to show you uh, a, a simple LDO that I've built for myself. I've tested it um, almost continuously uh, for the duration of several days to make sure that it uh, it's good enough and uh, nothing bad starts to happen after a while. I plan to power um, a hard drive, a 6 terabyte hard drive with, uh, an L with such an LDO. Well, at least the, the 5 volt rail. I already have the 12 volts rail. Anyway, um, so it's definitely a good enough LDO for some projects, okay? And I've already uh, accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. Um, uh, it's just gonna be shown in the next video. I'm, I'm going to show everything that I've made um, with that LDO, the, the entire project that involved that particular hard drive and a microcomputer. Anyway. In this video, I just want to show you um, how you can build uh, the simplest LDO. And I think I accidentally closed. Yeah, I'll just need to open it again. Um, and I will go to, I'll go through the process of um, explaining how I came to realize that you know the circuit works does its job how I designed it uh, and why everything is here so before I start to explain the circuit and I start to show you both simulations and real life uh, results let's take one step back and talk a little bit about what an LDO means as at least for uh, you know people that either don't know what an LDO means but they've heard this term before or people who just don't know at all so uh, if we take a look at power supplies and we split them uh, uh, based on um, their technology we could say that there are two categories. One is linear power supplies and um, the other one is switch mode power supplies. Now, switch mode power supplies are the most um, um, widely available nowadays because they are much more efficient than linear power supplies. Anyway, I'm not going to go into details because I still have a lot to learn about these kinds of power supplies. Uh, in turn, switch mode power supplies can be categorized into all sorts of categories based on their topology and uh, whether they have uh, isolation or not, uh, whether they step up or step down the voltage. Anyway, we're not going to go down that rabbit, ho rabbit hole. Um, we will focus a little bit on linear power supplies and because, because this is where LDOs appear. So... Linear power supplies, um, basically, is a general term uh, that is meant to uh, describe 
any power supply that um, has a, a, a current passing through it um, and where we have a, a significant um, loss of power due to that uh, current passing through the power supply because uh, the difference between the input voltage and the output voltage is present completely uh, in this uh, in this power supply and basically uh, we are losing uh, power equal to that difference of voltages times the uh, multiplied by the the current passing through that linear power supply okay so the term linear power supply is very generic for that particular kind of power supplies but within the realm of linear power supplies there are the things that are called LDOs low dropout okay now mm, Bear in mind that some people um, wrongly use the term LDO to refer to any linear power supply. That's not true. Uh, it is true that all LDOs are linear power supplies. However, not all linear power supplies are also LDOs as well. Um, unfortunately, the linear power supplies that are not LDOs do not have a uh, a, a distinct name so I wrote here just regular in quotation marks because I needed to differentiate uh, LDOs from all the other power supplies that are not LDOs okay a good example of a regular uh, linear power supply um, are the ones that use uh, integrated circuits like LM317 or 117, 217, because it's, it's another, um, it, it's an entire family of um, integrated circuits, uh, or LM137, 237, 337, um, 78L something or 79L something integrated circuits, or in general, any discrete circuit that uses an NPN transistor or a, 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 a collection of NPN transistors as the main element that the, the main semiconductor element that um, connects the input voltage to the output voltage. Okay. And if you take a look inside uh, uh, the, the circuit, the, the inner circuitry of these uh, um, integrated circuits, you will see there is a Darlington pair of NPN transistors in uh, all of these and in many others like uh, such integrated circuits. Um, this is a clear indication that we are not dealing with a low drop out. Okay. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have, um, I mean, within uh, the linear power supplies, the one that the ones that are not like this uh, are LDOs, and those are the low dropouts. They typically um use pnp transistors instead of npns or p mosfet uh, p channel mosfet uh, transistors um as the main active element that connects the input to the output um now in case the term dropout is not so um it, it's not so clear what are we talking about well in uh, in the usual uh, linear power supply we basically have um, an input an output and a ground okay and um, the dropout what we call dropout is the voltage between the input and the output okay whether it's low dropout or high dropout or whatever um, the value itself doesn't matter the term is the same the term dropout refers to the input to output voltage now typically for for a non-ldo linear circuit um, we can have up to 1.7 volts maybe up to 2 volts of voltage drop across our uh, regulator and our regulator also has um, a certain maximum current that it is able to uh, pass through it 
and uh, this is in function of all sorts of parameters such as temperature sometimes the current uh, drops down to a smaller value than what we want B basically what i'm saying is that if we uh, want to have a higher current going through our um, power supply all the way to the load then we have to employ some tricks to um, basically split the currents and have the higher current uh, pass through another transistor or another um, set of transistors separate from the, um, the voltage regulator uh, himself and this in turn implies an even greater um, uh, voltage drop because that particular transistor the, the simplest form of, of uh, providing a higher current is by basically using a PNP transistor placed like this um, relative to the voltage regulator and uh, this requires an extra resistor between its base and emitter and the idea is that when um, enough current passes through this resistor uh, which for us will be the, the the maximum current that we want to pass through the um, voltage regulator then uh, this transistor will start opening and it will allow current to pass through it and so it will create a second path for the current to flow and he will basically this transistor will basically take over um, most of the current that we do not want to pass through our stabilizer to our, through our regulator because our regulator cannot handle it but as with any power transistors um the base emitter voltage depends a lot on the current that we want to pass through them it is true that a, trans uh, a bipolar transistor starts to open at around 0.6 volts however the higher the current that passes through it the more this voltage can go up to 1.2, 1.3 volts in case of medium power transistors or even up to 2 volts in case of higher power transistors, okay? So in such a circuit, it is easy to see how we can have up to 4 volts of difference between the input and the output. Sometimes this is not a problem, um, but in other cases, this is a big problem. Not necessarily in terms of the dissipation power, but especially in terms of um, us wanting to have a regulated uh, voltage that is much closer than these 2 to 4 volts than the input voltage. Okay, so if we have, uh, let's say, if we have a uh, five, if we want to have five volts on the output, but we have only uh, seven volts on the input, then and we want to draw a significant current, like I don't know, one amp or so, um, then it is basically impossible for us to use such a solution um, because two volts are just not enough to to have a, a high current, uh, regular. Um, uh, um, linear power supply like this okay so in such cases we need to think about low dropout regulators which are still again they are still linear regulators but they do not work like this they work in a different way okay so uh, this is uh, what the dropout voltage means and therefore this is where the term low dropout comes from Okay, so I hope now uh, things are clear and we now know exactly what are we talking about when we are talking about uh, LDOs, okay? And why, for example, LM317, which is very popular, uh, is not an LDO at all. Especially if you take a look in the data sheet, uh, you'll see that it's not an LDO. So, um, let's dive into the circuit that I propose and then let's, uh, let's simulate it. Uh, I will show you how it works in simulation and then how it works in real life, at least the one that I've built for myself. So, uh, the general idea was that in order to not have a high uh, voltage drop, we cannot use an NPN transistor anymore because NPN transistors uh, by their uh, by their nature you know uh, require to have uh, uh, that particular I mean it's not that they require but they, they have that particular voltage drop okay so if we are to place an NPN transistor like this just just for the sake of uh, demonstration um, 
the output voltage will be the uh, uh, input voltage minus um, the voltage that is applied on the base of the transistor the highest voltage that we can apply on the base is essentially the input voltage by connecting the collector to the base of course this never happens in an actual power supply but uh, anyway just for the sake of uh, explanations right um so this is the highest voltage at which we can place this base of this npn transistor so we will always have a, a base emitter voltage drop uh, relative to the input okay and like i said this base emitter voltage drop can be up to two volts um, and only for this particular transistor but if we need to use more complex circuits that require more transistors um, they will have voltage drops of their own okay so we cannot use an npn transistor anymore as uh, the primary uh, semiconductor element so we need to use a pnp transistor because a pnp transistor will uh, when it will go into saturation basically it will take its collector and almost glue it metaphorically speaking to the emitter so the potential uh, relative to the ground the potential of the collector will be pretty much as close as the potential to the emitter is as possible okay so this is what forces us in the sim in the simplest form of this power supply this is what forces us to use a pnp transistor instead of an npn now for the sake of simplicity please uh, ignore the fact that i have two transistor placed in parallel here with small resistors I will explain those in a moment. Just ignore this T1 and consider there is just this T2 transistor, okay? So, the idea is that if we have only this transistor and this R3 resistor, ignore this R2 as well. Just consider it a, a, just a straight line as if it doesn't exist. Um, then we have a transistor that's forever closed, okay? Because we have uh, the base pulled uh, to its emitter, therefore zero volts. Uh, it's pulled by this R3 resistor which can be almost as high as possible uh, it's, it doesn't have a critical value I chose 120k because I had plenty of such resistors uh, they are rarely used so I tend to use them whenever I can in all sorts of places um, this transistor would be closed you know, by default in order to open it uh, so it would be blocked how we, what we say uh, it is blocked in order to switch it from block to saturation we need to take its base and pull it down to the ground towards the ground okay and this is what are we doing through the r5 resistor <clears throat> which must be calculated uh based on the current that we want on the output and the beta the beta factor the amplification factor of this particular transistor okay i've calculated it to be um well the mathematical value was higher than 120 ohms i uh, took it down to the nearest uh, standard value which is 120 ohms and uh, through this transistor some significant current will pass so it kind of needs to have a half a watt of dissipated power i wrote one watt just to be sure that uh, you know uh, it uh, it doesn't overheat but we don't want to you know pull this base down to the ground and keep it there because that will essentially turn on hard this transistor which will give on the output the same almost the same voltage as on the input no we want to um make sure that this transistor is somewhere open somewhere in between uh sat full saturation and fully closed and we want to sort of adjust this uh opening and closing of this transistor on the fly so we are passing this transistor through another uh transistor that acts as a switch uh, and we are uh, polarizing this uh, transistor through R4. Uh, basically, by placing this resistor in its base, we are injecting a current that's high enough to turn it all the way up to saturation, which will, you know, drag down this resistor, which in turn will open 
this transistor and it has the ability to turn this transistor fully on into saturation. However, um, at the same time, we now have T3 um, as uh, an element that can potentially uh, regulate, um, can potentially turn on and off this transistor or somewhere in between. And this is what we are doing with the rest of the circuit. We are um, taking a look at the output voltage relative to the ground through R6 and R7 voltage divider and we are feeding a fraction of this voltage to another NPN transistor which has the emitter collect uh, which has the um, uh, collector sorry connected to the base of T3 so in essence um as soon as the power uh, gets applied to the input we have um, R4 um, um, passing a current uh, in the base of T3 T3 will fully open, which in turn will fully open T2, which will start to provide uh, power on the output. However, uh, whenever, uh, as soon as the voltage on the output goes above a certain threshold, T4 starts to open because the, resist uh, the, the voltage across R7 resistor and therefore its base emitter will become high enough for it to open and by T4 opening it will pull the base of T3 down to the ground which will tend to close it which in turn will tend to close T2 um, and so the voltage regulation on the output happens okay um now there are a couple problems that need to be solved one of them is the fact that um well at, at least in my case um i wanted to be able to pass one amp of current uh, through this um power supply and since i chose uh, uh, these uh, very you know very standard uh, and old uh, transistors that uh, are still manufactured and uh, are still easily found on the market bd 140 um, these are actually medium power transistors they can go up to 1.5 amps um, their dissipation dissipated power is not all that great so i determined experimentally that um, uh, them having two watts of dissipated power uh, e even if i place a radiator on, on uh, such a transistor um, I would need to place a relatively big radiator in order for uh, transistor to be cooled down at the temperature that I enjoy uh, because I want to use this power supply 24-7 366 days a week uh, a year sorry so basically uh, I for, for my needs this power supply needs to be powered on complete constantly and ideally never be powered off and it should never burn it should never create problems so i wanted for this transistor to dissipate less heat in order to keep he, uh, himself cooler and so i split the current uh, through two uh, such transistors which are placed almost in parallel okay their bases are connected together their collectors are connected together uh, however i couldn't have uh, connected their emitters together as well because there would have been uh, some chances of uh, one transistor trying to steal too much current from the other um, to the point where it would become overheated and that would defeat the purpose of having two transistors so in order to prevent this from happening i also needed to add some small resistors in uh, series with uh, the emitters um, so that just in case one transistor tries to pull more current it will mean a, a higher voltage drop on the corresponding resistor um, but uh, since both transistors and resistors are connected together such thing will not be um will not be possible a lot because um the 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 voltage drop on one resistor plus the base emitter junction of that particular transistor will have to be exactly the same as the voltage drop on the other resistor plus the base emitter on the other transistor so if one transistor will 
would attempt to pull more current, it would not uh, be allowed by the other transistor, okay? Um, so that's one problem solved, and uh, for me, uh, for the way I will use this, uh, this LDO power supply, um, neither of these transistors go above 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, with uh, radiators, of course. Without radiators, um, I don't think they would be able to to be used. Anyway, anyhow, um, that was one problem. The other problem is that, um, and this is something common to all LDOs, they absolutely need uh, a capacitor on the output. And theoretically, it needs to be a low ESR capacitor. Um, Practically, in my case, I didn't need to bother with this thing. Uh, I could just use a, a regular uh, capacitor. Uh, but they definitely need uh, to have a capacitor on the output because otherwise this whole circuit will oscillate. Okay? Uh, and it will oscillate pretty badly. Um, I, uh, I I basically played a bit both with the simulation and uh, in real life with various capacitors of various um, capacitances and I, uh, I stopped at 470 micro farads, um, it seemed to be a good enough value. I didn't care too much. Um, you cannot add too much capacitance, you can only add too little capacitance. So. When in doubt, always add more, you know. Uh, there's also an extra capacitor here, which I initially I didn't thought I would need. Um, practically, I don't know for sure if I need it, but uh, according to the simulations that I've done, um, it should uh, have some improvement um, because um, b um, by uh, slowing down uh, the opening of this transistor T3, which in, turns, uh, in turn uh, opens the main transistors, uh, the power transistors, uh, by slowing this down, uh, I seem to be, um, even without this capacitor, I seem to be avoiding these oscillations. Um, in practice, I cannot say that I, I've seen uh, much improvement with or without this capacitor, but in the end I just chose to leave it in the circuit because, you know, it's it's basically free. I mean, it's, it costs so little that it, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and my circuit uh, definitely doesn't perform worse by him having... Uh, him, him being present here. So, this is pretty much my circuit, okay? It's pretty simple. Uh, as you can see, it doesn't require any Zener diode or uh, any other form of uh, uh, voltage reference, uh, integrated circuit or anything like that. It just relies on the fact that um, the output voltage, um, well, the control voltage, or, which is the base emitter of T4, is a fraction of the actual output voltage and therefore... Um, yeah, um, this is good enough for the regulation to happen. Um, from uh, actual measurements, I've seen that um, at least for these kinds of transistors, at least in my case, we have here exactly 600 millivolts across R7 and you know, the base emitter of T4. Exactly 600 millivolts. So you can easily calculate based on the resistances here and... Um, uh, 600 millivolts here, you know, how much, uh, how, how big uh, is going to be your voltage on the output. Now, let me show you quickly some uh, simulations, okay? We're going to be using a transient analysis. Um, I've set the input voltage to vary from 6.5 volts to 7.5. Because for me, I will use this LDO, and uh, this is another um, this is another important thing to to mention. Um, whenever you whenever you can deal with having, uh, let's say, a normal dropout or relatively high dropout, uh, you can easily use uh, a, a regular uh, linear uh, voltage uh, circuit, uh, voltage stabilizer. 
um, you don't need to use an LDO. You will use an LDO, or it, it makes sense to use an LDO only when the input volt, uh, the input voltage goes uh, very close to the output voltage, and you know a regular uh, linear uh, voltage stabilizer will no longer work. Uh, but if you have enough uh, voltage between the input and the output, then it doesn't make sense to use an LDO. It will work, of course, it will work, but it doesn't really make sense to use an LDO, okay? I'm, I'm just saying, you know, just to be sure uh, that uh, you understand uh, the idea. So, in my case, I will use this LDO in conjunction with um, a buck regulator, a DC-DC uh, step-down converter. Um, a while ago, about two weeks ago, I made a video uh, where I've shown you a comparison between five of the absolute cheapest uh, DC-DC step-down converters that I could find here in my country, ranging from uh, one and a half dollars or euros uh, up to, I think, only three euros was the most... Uh, uh, expensive one well the the fifth most uh, the fifth cheapest one but you know the most expensive one in this list of uh, step down converters and i've shown how um pretty much all of them had um what i would call horrible ripple voltage um they they had up to half a volt of ripple voltage um Honestly, I find that to be a bit too much, and in my projects, I, I, I can't really allow that to happen. So, basically, um, I am using um, because I want to step down from 12 volts to 5 volts. In the end, I'm using uh, such a very cheap uh, DC-DC converter to step it down as much as possible. And then, in order to have a much smoother voltage on the output, I'm using an LDO at, uh, at the output of this DC-DC converter. <clears throat> and uh, I'm using an LDO because I want to, to have uh, uh, as smaller losses as possible, okay? So, in my case, I... Um, well, in, in the end, I adjusted... Um, my uh, my DC DC converter to go from six and a half volts to seven volts. In this simulation, I went from six and a half to seven and a half volts. So this is why on the input voltage you see there is a triangle wave. It's not a, a straight line because I'm I don't have a, a, you know a DC current a DC voltage here. I have I have a DC voltage, but it it varies in time from six and a half to seven and a half volts. Okay, and now I've disabled uh, both the load and uh, the capacitors. So you can see in red that this is the output voltage. And uh, as you can see, the output voltage varies wildly from 6.7 volts down to 4.2 or perhaps even more and even less. Anyway, um, it oscillates wildly. Um, Oscillations tend to end if I uh, apply a load, and in the end I will have a roughly 5 ohm load because I will have roughly 1 amp of current at 5 volts. Um, we can see that the oscillations have kind of stopped, but uh, at the same time we, we don't really have, um, we still have a bit of a ripple, and we don't really have a, you know, a, a very steady voltage, and the ripple is still... Hmm, a bit too much, like, I don't know, 250, 300 millivolts. Anyway, so we definitely need this output capacitor. Um, however, what I wanted to show you by, you know, enabling this and disabling these things is that um, not only with the output capacitor on, but at least in the simulation, it appears that uh, this capacitor alone could potentially uh, solve the problem of... Um, uh, of these oscillations. Now, I haven't tried this in real life, having just this capacitor, but not the output capacitor. I haven't tried, so I cannot guarantee. What I can guarantee is that um, uh, the output capacitor is enough. You know, especially 470, 
uh, microfarad uh, is enough uh, for this uh, uh, LDO to, to work stably. Uh, it can work with uh, less than that, you know, um, sorry, 100 micro. Okay, it can work with less than that. Uh, we can uh, activate um, uh, the load as well. But of course, uh, since we are pulling one amp of current, um, one amp of current is um, a significant current. So it makes sense that we, um, you know, we have a higher value of capacitor in here. Um, at the same time, you know, um, because at least in this circuit, we don't really have to bother all that much with ESR, um, we can easily choose a higher value capacitor because uh, in reality, the, the costs of these capacitors um, are small. Of, uh, electrolytic capacitors nowadays are relatively cheap, okay? So just to quickly demonstrate this, um, I'm not sponsored in any way by anyone. I'm, I'm just picking my favorite, uh, you know, um, uh, component distributor. Uh, the cheapest one microfarad capacitor rated for some significant voltage, not just 10 volts or so, um, costs about 2.7 cents per capacitor. At least if we buy 100 of them at the same time, you know, it costs us only 2.7 euros, which is cheap. Um, 10 microfarads costs 3.2 cents per capacitor. Um, 100 microfarads cost 3.3 cents per capacitor. 220 microfarads, 5 cents. And 470 microfarads, 35 volts, costs only 10 cents per capacitor. Um, I mean, really, this is, this is cheap, so we can easily just place a higher value capacitor without having to uh, to worry about the fact that we have to pull a lot of money out of our pockets okay so <clears throat> that uh, solves the problem with the output capacitor um as far as the input capacitor goes i've explained to you the idea now i don't know yeah so um in simulations it uh, it doesn't seem to do much with or without load well, actually, with without load, uh, it does uh, it does uh, have an effect if we don't have the output capacitor. With load, it doesn't seem to do much. But again, we we still need the output capacitor for the necessary smoothing of the output voltage. We even with this capacitor, the smaller one here, um, we are not um, off the hook, uh, so to speak. We, we we just have to add the output capacitor okay so that's pretty much it with the simulations now let me quickly show you uh actual um actual print screens of what's going on on the output um the first tests that i've done were with a linear power supply uh, connected on the input uh, about 6.7 volts on the input of course 5 volts on the output um, so uh, because uh, it, it tends to uh, to have uh, different ripple voltages at the output based on what we feed it at the input so if we give it a, a very smooth input voltage dc input voltage um, the ripple will be relatively small at no current whatsoever we have about 7 millivolts peak to peak ripple voltage or about 2 millivolts rms but uh, this ripple will be of relatively high uh, frequency um, 10, uh, 15, 20 megahertz, uh, you know, this uh, this frequency counter was not very accurate, but it was relatively accurate. So here we have 7.8 megahertz of ripple voltage. Uh, at 1 milliamp of current, the ripple goes uh, up immediately. Uh, we have about 34 millivolts peak to peak or uh, 7 RMS. At 500 milliamps of current, um, we have about 42 millivolts peak to peak, which is good, pretty good. I mean, it's not the best. We could have had lower, but it's it's still decently good. Uh, 42 millivolts peak to peak, 12 RMS. 
and we see a much clearer waveform here that has about 17 megahertz um and if we go up to one amp uh, we see that we have pretty much the same ripple voltage so between half an amp and one amp um, we don't see much uh, difference um i've also done an fft analysis to see you know what frequencies do i have and um this is at one milliamp of current this is at one amp of current uh 12 and a half megahertz per vertical division uh, per horizontal division sorry um so we have around 12 megahertz here um the main frequency of our ripple voltage and about 24 megahertz or so here um and we can ignore this my oscilloscope only goes up to 50 megahertz this is around 100 so and above so this is most likely artifacts of the mathematical calculations okay so yeah um and these are the results with a stable uh, input voltage however like i said in my case i will use this ldo with um, a, a buck converter on the input with yellow you see the buck converters output which goes from about six and a half to some seven volts um and it's it it has a pretty horrible ripple uh, with blue you see the output of the LDO which is pretty flat and if I couple it in AC and I zoom it in um, and well we have the, the colors inverted here with yellow we see the, the ripple of the output of the LDO when we have the buck converter on the input and um, <clears throat> even at 900 milliamps close to 1 amp we have only about 200 millivolts of peak-to-peak uh, -peak ripple but it's mostly because of this very sharp um, very very sharp um, uh, edges or i don't know how you would call them sharp spikes um which are potentially created by the dc dc converter uh but if we place two um cursors here because the, the majority of the oscillations happen uh, between uh, this yellow line that's kind of overlapped with the blue line and this lower yellow line, uh, then we see that we have only some 50 something uh, millivolts peak to peak of, um, of ripple voltage and only about 20 RMS, 20 millivolts RMS, because these are just brief um, tri triangle shapes, uh, uh, ripples that happen from time to time so overall the ldo does its job pretty good um i'm definitely a lot happier with this ripple than with the, the other ripple of 400 or 500 millivolts of actual triangle wave ripple um so yeah for me this does the trick so i'm definitely gonna use uh, I'm definitely going to be using uh, this uh, circuit in this project of mine and I'll show you in the next uh, video. So I hope you found uh, these informations useful. Like I said, I cannot yet explain to you in great details um, how to perform a, a professional analysis on LDOs and uh, how to make sure that they do not oscillate. Uh, however, um, you know at least this particular model that i'm presenting to you uh is trustworthy i've tested it i will be using it so if you have the same need that i've had right now you can use it uh, without a problem i will do some more studies in the future and um, of course i'll come back with uh, new videos so thanks a lot for watching um, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more of these videos. Also, um, if you can, please consider supporting my world on Patreon. I have a link in the description. The faster I can buy components and uh, electronic lab um, devices, the faster I can learn. And the more I will come here on YouTube and teach you as well, so that you don't have to waste as much time and energy that uh, I have studying all of these things and performing all of these experiments. 
Thank you very much and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye. Mm.